It is my privilege to introduce you to Suresh Kanakaraja. Suresh has asked me to be brief so that he can regale you of his stories and those of his students. But I insist on letting you know what a fine scholar Suresh is and what a contribution he has made to our profession. He is the Kirby Professor in Language Learning at Pennsylvania State University, where he teaches world Englishes, teaching and research in second language writing, post-colonial studies, and theories of rhetoric and composition in the departments of English and Applied Linguistics. He previously taught at the Baruch College and Graduate Center at City University of New York. And before that, he taught in his home country of Sri Lanka. He has published in a wide range of professional journals on bilingual communication, learning of writing, and English language teaching. Among the awards he has received for his work are the following. The Modern Language Association Award for his book, Resisting Linguistic Imperialism in English Teaching, Oxford University Press, 1999, considered the best research publication on the teaching of language and literacy for that year. His next publication, Geopolitics of Academic Writing, University of Pittsburgh Press, 2002, won the Gary Olson Award for the best book in social and rhetorical theory. And in 2007, his study of world Englishes in composition won the Braddock Award for the best article in the College Composition and Communication Journal. As many of you know, Suresh is the editor of our academic journal, TESOL Quarterly, which is a widely respected journal in our profession. In pursuance of his goal to democratize academic publishing, he has succeeded in making changes on behalf of international authors, striving, for example, to give opportunities to aspiring writers who may not choose to write in the conventional manner. In his research, Suresh is currently analyzing interview transcripts and survey data from South Asian immigrants in Canada, USA, and UK to consider questions of identity, community, and heritage languages in diaspora communities. We will now hear from Suresh Kanagaraja on this topic and no doubt on many others as he addresses the issue of worlds of practice in search of community. I give you Suresh Kanagaraja. It was one of those hot and humid days in Sri Lanka where I first started teaching. Uh, the local American cultural agency had arranged for three uh, TESOL uh, experts to visit my university and uh, share with us the latest in TESOL methods and techniques. For three long days, these three wonderful ladies trudged from an air-conditioned hotel uh, to my rural university you see right here um, to uh, share, sh share their wisdom with us. But on the last day, they mentioned, we have a request for you. We want, uh, just about two hours before they were to fly off to the United States finishing up uh, this training session, they said, we want a couple of you to come up and demonstrate a model lesson. We want to videotape it and take it back to the United States where we want to study how you teach uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I was looking to my senior teachers there who had taught there for about 20 or 30 years I was hoping that they would uh, volunteer and give a good account of our teaching practices. But no, no, no one arose, and uh, it was getting embarrassing. So I had just started a year back. I went up, and I said, I'll do a model lesson for you. <laughs> I took up a, a, teacher, a, a book that had recently been gifted from the United States. I think uh, it adopted the communicative language teaching approach. There was a narrative. Uh, and some role play based on the story. 
Um, and I took the book and did what we always do there, what our students demand, explicated the grammar rules uh, to our students. The students enjoyed it, they were very engaged, and I was very satisfied, I was about to take my seat, when the TESOL experts said, uh, hold on, we have a couple of questions for you. We want to understand what just took place there. And the first expert asked me, what method did you adopt? Um, I didn't know too many names of methods those days. <laughs> and it also looked like I had taken a book that ad adopted one method and used a nameless, untheorized uh, method that we use locally, so I fumbled for an answer. Then a second uh, expert asked me another question, which sounded a little sarcastic. She asked me, uh, what language did you teach? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was teaching English. <laughs> um, and then she clarified, what was your target language? Well, I figured out the problem. Our textbooks used American English and teachers and students use Sri Lankan English with an accent that I'm using now. To com complicate matters, we code switch a lot. We use our first language, Tamil, and English in the classroom, as we do always outside in the streets. So I fumbled for an answer once again. But I realized for the first time that, uh, that methods and practices that I adopt, I take for granted, um, seem to uh, raise questions and concerns for outsiders. I realized for the first time that there is a huge professional organization, TESOL, that's looming be uh, behind me. <laughs> and I had to grapple with the question of how my local practices in Sri Lanka relate to the professional orthodoxy. So I went to my senior teachers and I asked them, where do you get this knowledge? Where do you get an understanding of the right method to adopt? Where does it come from? You see, my uh, senior teachers who have been teaching for 25 or 30 years uh, have never gone outside for training. They all start locally and teach locally. So um, it was all hearsay. So they said, this knowledge comes from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from an organization called TESOL. <laughs> there, they have an annual convention and behind these closed doors, in the back rooms, all these editors and committee members get together and they write down the rules <laughs> that become fashionable the next year. <laughs> so I was uh, dumbstruck. I knew I had to go for this convention, but they tried to be helpful. They said, don't even dare because just the registration cost would take 10 months of your salary. <laughs> but they tried to be helpful. They said, here in our resource room, we have the books they send us. If you read them, you'll get an understanding of the right method, the right teaching approach. So that's what I did. I went to our resource room. I still remember the titles we had there. Uh, you might remember some of them. Uh, they were already about 10 years old. But uh, here in our resource room, they were gathering dust because nobody seemed to have come through them. Um, I said to myself, I'm going to put myself through a regiment of reading one book after another for the next two months because I want to be a confident teacher who knows the correct approach, the correct method. I don't know if it helped uh, because at the end of the second month, all that happened to me was uh, my mind was a blur of names of methods and labels for theories which didn't seem to connect too well. My colleagues still remember those days. They say I used to come up and in almost every conversation, I'll uh, throw up a technical term of two to, th to impress them, uh, terms which neither they nor I understood. <laughs> you might ask, uh, how then did we get professionalized in Sri Lanka? How does one get to be a teacher of English? So soon after we, I finished my first degree in literature, uh, some of my colleagues and I were uh, hired by the local university. And when I reported for work on the first day, uh, the chair of the department uh, threw a textbook into my open arms 
and said, that is the textbook, there is your classroom. Now march on, good and faithful soldier, teach. I checked the time and I saw that there were 15 more minutes for the first class. So I walked to what they call the staff room. Uh, the staff room is a place of uh, a lot of talk, hot tea, and spicy samosas. This is where the teachers come after they are uh, between their classes to relax, to discuss things. And when I, found, I went there, I found that these people had a separate identity. There was a lot of code switching. There was a lot of talk about English textbooks. Uh, they were different from the other rooms, which were sociology or physics. Uh, and soon they shared with me uh, what I should be doing on the first day, how I should be uh, talking about the textbook I had with me. So I got a sense that we were all in this together. We had a project here, we teach English, and I can count on these people to help me out. After the class, I didn't go back home. I came back to the staff room, and uh, I shared with them some of the problems I faced. And uh, I found that there were people here from different specialities, and they were prepared to help me. So there was one with a first degree in education who told me something about classroom management. There was another with a first degree in linguistics who talked to me about uh, explaining a grammar rule. And they had questions for me because I was from literature. Uh, they asked me about terms like genre or voice or characterization or plot, which they had to explain to their students. So I had the sense that we were all going to draw from our resources, our own specialties, to uh, grapple with the problems we faced here, teaching English. Over time, we uh, developed our own theories, our own concepts to what we do in Jaffna, in, in, in our classrooms. Uh, I f grew up into the terms our colleagues were using. And uh, I still remember we had some special terms that nobody else in the professional world seemed to use or understand. So we used a term called ELP. Others talk about EGP, English for general purposes, or ESP, English for special purposes. But we used English for library purposes. And that's a realistic uh, acknowledgement of the needs our students had for learning English. Uh, they follow their lectures in Tamil. They write their answers in Tamil. And the important need they had for English is to read reference books. So that's why I have probably had taught formal English for literacy purposes with a good dose of grammar. As far as communication was concerned, we code switch. So we have a kind of a bifurcated uh, pedagogy of uh, grammar teaching on the one hand and code switched uh, conversations on the other. Uh, this practice is our own uh, development of a methodology which others uh, probably wouldn't understand. So uh, now I find that we can't uh, slight these three resources, these three features of professionalization because this is what uh, these two uh, famous authors, Jean Lev and Etienne Wenger, present as constitutive of any professional experience. Uh, and you know, these uh, two books that came in 1991 and 98 have taken the academy by storm. Uh, fields like sociology, management, education, are uh, all adopting uh, lessons, uh, themes from this book for their fields. And TESOL has joined the bandwagon. As you can see, uh, we're going to focus on communities of practice uh, in this conference. And uh, I'm asking myself, have you really grown to the realization that this notion would entail radical shifts in the way we look at classroom life and professional relationship? The interesting thing about uh, this book is that it adopts uh, forms of professionalization in non-Western communi communities like mine. So these two authors talk about how mid-fives in uh, Mexico uh, get professionalized into their work, uh, how tailors in Liberia uh, get socialized into their practice. And in my own community of, in South Asia, uh, this kind of situated learning, collaborative learning, apprenticeship goes centuries back. So this is an image of a, a young man learning traditional Ayurvedic medicine at the foot of the master. Um, we have the Guru Shishya system, uh, where some disciples join uh, the, the master, live with him in an ashram, 
and pick up his wisdom over time by observing him doing things that he teaches. Um, follow, looking at this model, I could understand how in Sri Lanka, uh, through our experience, uh, we had developed terms and theories which made sense to us, but may not for others, because uh, Wenger talks about reification uh, as an important concept uh, by which experiences lead to labels, theories, and uh, uh, terms. So ELP is our reification of our experience, and that's how our, we explain our teaching in Sri Lanka. Just the same way that the TESOL experts uh, had uh, terms like CLT, communication, uh, communicative language teaching, which comes from their experience of teaching their students. And I must confess, uh, it didn't make too much sense to us at that point. Um, I, I now understand, reading Wenger, that CLT is a, a reification of uh, teaching uh, cultures, learning cultures, classroom conditions, uh, priorities that our T uh, TESOL experts uh, experienced be before they came to uh, my university. Um, and Wenger is careful to say that you can't mandate pedagogies from outside uh, on a local community. I could now understand how uh, some of our uh, senior teachers led a kind of a double life. Uh, when the experts left back to the United States, they would write wonderful letters thanking them for the great methodology they uh, taught us. But they would just return back to the old ELP uh, as far as our classroom life was concerned. Um, it, just, it doesn't mean that we didn't use CLT. Uh, we did. Whenever TESOL experts came and taught us a new label or two, uh, we did uh, adopt uh, the terms that they taught us. But we meant something totally different from them. Uh, CLT for us meant a lot of direct uh, grammar teaching and the role play that involved code switching. I'm glad Dr. Nak Lakshmi Narayan was talking about CLT, but also he explained it in terms of some of the testing situations there, some of the uh, policies that required C C CLT to be adopted for their purposes. But we are uh, getting more stories from other uh, classroom communities, not only in Sri Lanka, of how uh, a concept like CLT that was reified in a different uh, pedagogical uh, community is creating tensions uh, and conflicts for some teachers in local communities. So I looked at TESOL quarterly, and just for the last uh, three or four years, not at other journals, not beyond three, four years, and we have this amount of reports from diverse communities on the struggles teacher, teachers face with CLT. By the way, I must say, uh, communicative language teaching is just a, a, a random example. It could be any method that is uh, imposed from one community over the other. So the last story here by Amy Sui is a great example. It just appeared in the TESOL Cotley in December. It's a story about one teacher, Min Fang, who struggles with a pedagogy that seems to make better sense to his colleagues and to his students and an imposition from his administrators that uh, he should adopt CLT. So finally, he ends up uh, defining CLT as cruel language teaching. <laughs> uh, that's his uh, reification of that concept in the local community. That's how people might say that um, understand the local situation that we probably don't understand what CLT really means. But it's also possible that the local interpretation of uh, CLT doesn't make sense to outsiders. Or uh, there are local pedagogies and practices which are denigrated by our orthodoxy. So now, thankfully, we have teachers who go to many local communities and try to understand from the local perspective how teaching practices make sense or have functionality in those communities. So this is a great example of an article by Martha Wright, an ethnographer, who went to Eritrea, a small community in um, West Africa, sorry, East Africa. And uh, she's, when she went there, she was told, we adopt communicative practices here. We have group work. And when she looked carefully, she found that the group work involved groups of students standing up in the class and repeating what the teacher said. <laughs> she calls it chanting, uh, some of the important uh, aspects of the lesson. 
or just bursting into song in small groups. <laughs> so, so she said, that's not group work. But over time, as she lived there for many months, she found that um, in a large classroom with very little teaching material, this helped reinforce the lesson of the teacher. It uh, involved the whole body and the heart and mind in the learning process, which was important for the local uh, students and communities. Uh, it provided some uh, variation from the rhythms of teaching, from listening to the teacher all the time. So she ended up, ended up with an article titled, More Than Just Chanting. And that's what we hear from many other uh, contexts, again, from T. Saul Cotterly, reports from uh, authors who have studied the local pedagogical situation and find that they make sense. So for example, repetition in India, you know, repeating uh, uh, things that have been said or in the book, standing up and repeating them, or translation in Japan, uh, test-based teaching in Taiwan, memorization in China, this is all uh, denigrated in our professional orthodoxy, but these wonderful researchers say, in the local context, given the cultures of learning, we might have to take another look at uh, the usefulness of these practices. This is what I thought, anyway, because um, I didn't have all this professional literature, uh, and definitely not Wenger and Lev in my uh, university in Sri Lanka. So I really thought the teaching practices we have are just stupid. Uh, they don't make sense. And I decided, after, after this two-month regiment of reading uh, theoretical books failed, I have to go to the United States to become more professional. I have to get an MA in TESOL or PhD in Applied Linguistics if I'm to call myself a teacher. So uh, I, uh, I, I, re I didn't realize the irony then. Here were Lev and Wenger talking about professionalization as well exemplified by practices in uh, traditional communities like mine, the informal apprenticeship experience uh, that we had. Actually, universities here were beginning to adopt that, but I traveled 20,000 miles uh, from Sri Lanka to study Wenger and Lev in classrooms here and to become professional. So uh, I realized uh, that to some extent, uh, though professionalization might be similar in uh, different places, adopt similar trends, I had to uh, enroll myself in a, a MAT SOL or a PhD applied linguistics and formally, institutionally, get legitimized as a teacher. So I was uh, happy in one sense to come to the United States because this is the first time I had the experience of looking at methods from the local point of view, from the point of view of local communities of practice. Why did people here value the methods they do? Uh, how does one method get treated as better than the other? Uh, and uh, those days, during my um, uh, coursework, I had great fascination for graphs and diagrams, trying to figure out the connections between methods. Uh, and the earlier bubbles uh, with all the technical terms, theoretical terms, and labels for methods now fell into place. And my notebooks were full of uh, charts like this, trying to figure out how methods related to the other. After this, and getting my PhD, I was really proud of myself. I said, now I'm ready to be a real teacher of English language. And uh, nobody's going to question me. Nobody's going to treat me like a joke. I know what to answer. I have the wisdom, the knowledge that goes with this profession. My first job, my first tenure track job was here in New York City, uh, City University of New York, Baruch College. As you can see, uh, this is um, very different from the bucolic rural university of Jaffna that you saw before. But one thing was similar. This was equally multilingual, like in Sri Lanka. Uh, Baruch College uh, claims that uh, it's the most diverse institution in the country among its students, uh, students who come from about 130 language groups, and I fit right in. Till the day the, the chair of my de department came for a classroom observation. <laughs> and that was on the very first semester, fall of 1994. I was ready for him. I thought, I know what group work means. Here you could move the chairs around and create new groups. In Sri Lanka, we had classrooms which were standing room only. Uh, here we had printers and copiers where you could make your own uh, activities and print and distribute them to the students. In Sri Lanka, we didn't have paper. So 
I thought the class uh, activity, the group activity went well. Students were engaged. They produced the results, the answers I was looking for. And I thought the chair of my department is going to go back and write, tenure this guy right now. <laughs> but I was surprised. After making uh, his initial matter-of-fact observations about what this lesson was about and the purpose of the lesson, he ended with this conclusion. Apparently, he had detected some small groups using Chinese to figure out their tasks and answers. And he was asking himself, what class is this, Chinese or English? <laughs> this is deja vu for me. Somebody else uh, way back in my early professional career had asked me, what is camel doing in your classroom? I knew I was in a mess. Uh, I had to find a way out. And then the thought struck me, the most recent piece all quarterly, uh, you had to give credit for me, this, the fall, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the autumn 1994 issue uh, just, that had come just a month or so back, I probably had read very well. Uh, al almost all the articles here were about the use of L1 in the teaching of a second language English. Although uh, the special topic was uh, English as an additional language in K-12 schools, this theme was so prominent that the editors, the guest editors of the journal, uh, Christian Faltes and uh, Sarah Huddleston, uh, spent a considerable uh, space in the editorial introduction to talk about the place of Spanish in, treating, in teaching English. So I put this whole issue into the mailbox of my chair <laughs> <laughs> with a sticky note saying, John, uh, please read some of the articles here. Uh, the L1 may not be dysfunctional after all. And he did. And a week later, he put in a revised um, a report uh, in my mailbox. And uh, he ended with a new conclusion. And I have, this is in my personnel file in Baruch College. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone back many times later. I've read this uh, closely many times because I want to understand how future chairs would read uh, the type of teacher I am and the type of methods I use. Are they saying I'm a brilliant teacher? Are they saying this method is excellent? No, I guess he's just saying, Professor Karagraja showed me the latest issue of Peace All Cotley, which dealt with the ways in which ES schools can use their primary language. He's just acknowledging that as a possibility. Is he saying I'm a brilliant teacher? He's clearly highly knowledgeable in his field and knows the latest research. I guess he says uh, he reads Peace All Cotley regularly. But I'll take that because I was saved. And that's how I was, uh, I continued to teach at Baruch College for 13 more years, till about six months back uh, when I moved to Pennsylvania. But this uh, left me with a, 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 a very sad feeling that I still didn't fit in into this professional community. I was shaken by this episode. I was asking myself, here I am, came to the United States, uh, obtained my PhD, have all these wonderful charts and diagrams in my notebook, I thought I had mastered the knowledge, and somebody's still telling me, you don't belong here. You have to explain yourself. Well, I shared my concerns with my uh, colleagues, uh, and they were very helpful. They said, we know what's happening to you. You have a professional identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and you are in the right place, because here in the opposite, Upper West Side, there are all these psychiatric offices. You probably didn't know that New York, by all estimates, is the most neurotic city in the country. <laughs> and you have help. So I did take a look at uh, some of the websites of the psychiatrists. <laughs> they mentioned, of course, career assessment counseling as something that they would provide for me. And they had other important things that I needed, like public speaking phobias, school phobias, not to mention bed wetting and uh, nail biting. <laughs> <laughs> but darn it, I couldn't get the $400 for the initial consultation. So I thought, what can I do? Then the thought struck me, there was one whole section of uh, Wenger that I hadn't read. You see, I've been just talking to you all this time about the place of practices in a professional community. But there was a whole section about how we become members in a community develop identities in a community. 
So I said to myself, rather than paying $400 to sit in the psychiatrist's couch in the Upper West Side, I'll sit home, sit on my own comfy couch at home with a warm cup of tea and read the second section of Wenger. And I must tell you, it was a cathartic experience. <laughs> I came out with a new vision of myself. What King Wenger tells me is that there are other sides to our identity. There are other memberships we enjoy which have relevance to our professional life. So I wasn't surprised that my membership in the University of Jaffna teaching community crept in into my teaching at Baruch College. What Wenger would say is, don't ignore it, don't suppress it, work for some kind of negotiation, work for some kind of reconciliation. You can't uh, keep it away uh, because you have a nexus of multi-membership and they have relevance for each other. Uh, it involves negotiation, and the word is important for many other reasons, because uh, to become a member of a professional community, it's not only the need to take on their discourses, labels, uh, and be, develop an identification that is important. But if you want to be a person that matters in that community, if you want to have agency voice, you have to negotiate. You have to make a space for your other identities, other values in the teaching community. Um, and, but at the same time, negotiation is not an easy thing. Uh, Wenger says it's a gradual achievement. It involves give and take. Uh, when I finished reading this section, I thought, hey, this is what I did with the chair of my department. I had made a space for my teaching in Sri Lanka and what I understood there for, to show the relevance here. But I did it without being brusque and rude. I could have just walked up to him and said, look here, Mr. Monolingual white man. <laughs> <laughs> you understand nothing about multilingual communicative practices or learning practices. <laughs> well, that wouldn't have been a winning strategy <laughs> because he, he would have said, go back to where you came from. <laughs> what I did was I showed him the latest TESOL quarterly and said, look at the journals you uh, value here. Look at your, the uh, scholars who write from your country. And look at the classrooms here where they teach Spanish and they see a relevance. And um, he bought that argument. So uh, negotiation is not only good for the member, but uh, Wenger goes on to say it's good for the whole community. That's how a whole professional community rethinks its practices, enriches itself. So I must tell you, I must give credit to Baruch College. Uh, for 13 more years, they tolerated my negotiation. And it might surprise you that the last professional development workshop I did for the faculty, last spring in fact, was on code switching in formal academic writing. The chair 13 years back had found it a problem when someone used code switching in informal group work. Now he was si sitting back in this lecture hall with all the senior colleagues and considering the possibility can multilingual students use other discourses, registers, even their own languages in formal academic writing? And I too had become bold. I had grown a couple of notches higher to push this idea of code switching into formal expression in writing. It's a story for another time, but that's not the reason I, I was fired from Baruch College. <laughs> um, this experience uh, inspired me so much. This whole chapter inspired me so much. And this victory, the initial victory with the chair, made me giddy with success that I said, I have to think about the other identities I have and how they have relevance for teaching. There are non-academic, non-teaching identities we have. And when I looked at uh, Wenger, he does say, uh, just because you're a teacher, it doesn't mean that you, have to, you can ignore or leave aside your identities as a mother, a musician, a political activist, they all matter. They can enrich your teaching. So the next day I sat on my comfy couch with my hot cup of tea. I thought I should make a list of all my identities. This is what I came up with. I was so happy that there were so many diverse sides to my personality <laughs> that uh, they would real, make a real difference in my teaching. But when I read them closely, my heart sank. It looked like... <laughs> 
some of these identities were in tension, they were conflictual, that I would have serious problems trying to resolve them in the first place before trying to look for connections to my teaching. So uh, I looked at Wenger again, and he consoled me. What he says is, then who said identity negotiation is ever completely resolved? We will always live with tensions. And more importantly, negotiating identities in professional communities is an ongoing thing. You're not going to finish it at one point. So it's hard, it's a hard lesson, but there are some good things that might come out of it. Um, when I introduces the idea of brokering, of becoming, of becoming brokers, people with multiple identities, multiple memberships, can draw from one, the other, commu other communities of practice, uh, bring in values, practices that can enrich the community they are involved in. And back and forth, they can uh, send values, practices from their teaching uh, community outside to their political community, maybe. So, uh, he go but he goes on to say there is a risk involved in being a broker. You have to remain at the boundary of your professional community. You can't be an insider. The insiders might have a vested interest uh, in, their, in the values and practices that that community has. Uh, but uh, you need a little detachment from traditional knowledge, accepted wisdom, if you want to shuttle back and forth between other communities and the community right here. And he goes on to say, certain individuals seem to thrive on being brokers. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to be. I want to be a broker. I want to shuttle back and forth with, my, with other communities. I thought to myself, maybe I'm making a virtue out of necessity because I'm always an outsider. I'm from this God-forsaken country called Sri Lanka. Who can be an insider anyway? But then it's better to use uh, your uh, other identities for your advantage. This might give a critical edge into my profession. So I resolved to be an outsider, a, a pe have a peripheral participation uh, in, the, in the community of practice I was in. It's a long way I've come from my search for professional identity, for my search for wisdom with the help of Wenger. Uh, I wanted authority in teaching. Uh, Wenger says, sometimes you have to be an outsider in the outside uh, of, the, uh, of the, the, the boundaries of the profession. I wanted stability in my identity. Uh, Wenger says, you'll have tensions all the time. I wanted a, a mastery over this profession, travel 20,000 miles to the United States to become an expert. And Wenger says, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, it's not going to end ever. It's a hard lesson to accept, but it's, it's a realistic uh, uh, position to be in. Wenger has also helped me understand that uh, other communities of practice, like the one I had in Jaffna, has its own practices, uh, which shouldn't be treated like a joke. They are reifications of their local cultures of learning. Um, not, I have been taught not to laugh at other forms of professionalization. Informal, they might be. Um, it's uh, local, uh, they might be but they all have uh, apprenticeship experiences in a situated learning environment. So that has been useful, but I still have a score to settle with professional communities. That is, in the early encounter, you would see there was something orthodox about the way things are done. There was an acceptance of a method as superior to other methods. So I told, my, told myself, I still have to figure out how local communities relate to the professional community, the larger professional community. Let's call it TESOL in our case. Um, or to reframe the question, what is the place of TESOL, the professional community, in a context where we just have diverse local communities with our own communities of practice? Do we still need this organization anyway? <laughs> so um, I never thought about this question because I'd always thought of myself as a humble teacher not an administrator, policy maker, board member. But now I had to wrestle with the question, uh, I can't be in a kind of a fool's paradise just negotiating with local communities. I have to think about the larger professional discourses, the orthodoxy, uh, the, the wider professional group. Where could I go for help? I forgot that there was one more section in Wenger. <laughs> just one more. Neatly tucked away in the epilogue was the great chapter on how umbrella organizations that bring together smaller communities of practice should uh, uh, build themselves up. What are the assumptions? So uh, Wenger goes on to say, uh, he uses a very innocuous word, organizations. 
Now, organizations uh, means for uh, this model, a uh, nation state, for example, with many social groups. It can mean uh, a cultural community, for example, with many subcultural groups. It can mean a disciplinary community like sociology or physics, or it can mean a professional community like us. Uh, and the key difference for Wenger is that organizations are not made up of policies, uh, philosophies, uh, ideas, but practices, the diverse practices its members have. So it's a kind of a paradox to think of one huge organization that's not built on uh, priorities, values, uh, assumptions, but the things people do in their local communities. So in order to be true to this model, uh, Wenger says, the organization shouldn't stifle the enterprise of the local communities. He also wanted to say, uh, if the organization imposes uh, policies, methods on others, it's not just bad for the local community, it's bad for the whole organization. He says, uh, such an organization is always less than itself. It's the diverse practices that enrich the organization. Uh, and then he, he has one of the most poetic lines in the book where he summarizes uh, his definition of a wider professional community. The, let's say the professional organization of TESOL connects by crossing. It does not sit on top, it moves in between. It does not unify by transcending, it connects and disconnects. It does not reign, it travels. So I try to unpack this wonderful poetic statement of how a professional organization can be. So I put down uh, so, some of the differences that uh, uh, seem to come up. Uh, Wenger doesn't name the traditional organization, uh, so I gave it the name centralized organization. And if you ask for one word that might sum up the difference, um, the traditional organization is centripetal. It draws the local communities to itself. It tells the local communities, behave like me. Uh, take on these ideas. Take on these philosophies. The constellation of practices model says, guys, be different. Go and develop your own practices, because it is through this diversity that I define myself. It is through your difference that I find being. So uh, I ask myself, where does this all belong? I thought and thought. <laughs> But there are good reasons why TESOL started the way it did uh, 40 years back. And this is uh, the first essay in the first ever TESOL quarterly by Harold Allen, a founding member of the TESOL organization. And he says TESOL quarterly was started because it had to be a collective voice. And in all the other uh, reasons he gives for the formation of this organization is the word common, common, common. I had a couple of more slides which I left out uh, to save time. Uh, but all this commonality is important because at that time, all our disciplines had a sickness. They had to define their autonomy and their independence, uh, why we are a separate group. So uh, Harold Allen does talk about that. We are a specialized field, a discipline, and this is not the place to talk about the messy diversity that people have. So going along with this, then he uh, outlines the different institutions that uh, TESOL is made of. And when you look at this list, you can think of TESOL thinking of itself like a clearinghouse for news and information, a gatekeeper for knowledge through the TESOL quarterly, uh, as a norms enforcer coming up with standards that uh, would help people assess students, understand what are the standards to adopt. And finally, an accrediting agency. TESOL would say, who can be a teacher? when they travel outside. Of course, much has changed since then, and we don't uh, follow uh, you know, these kinds of assumptions anymore. But this is a very high calling. And I ask myself, how can such a centralized structure of TESOL move to a more decentered model that the community's practice invites? How can we think of a professional organization that is based on plurality, based on diversity? So, once again, uh, this is uh, for the experts on how to think of a professional organization that uh, can be built around localness, diversity. But I will just give some free reign to my imagination and thought of a couple of possibilities. To start with, uh, we might have to have the TESOL convention in other parts of the world every year. <laughs> okay. 
Or there are teachers from uh, Nigeria or Nepal who say, uh, we have all these wonderful experiences. We need a place to sit down and talk uh, and reify our concepts into theories. And our professional organization would say, here's the money. Go and buy, get a staff, build a staff room, get your tea and samosas, and talk. It's good. <laughs> or there are people uh, in, uh, say, Sudan who say, we have all these wonderful teaching practices that are in scraps of paper. We would like to publish them into textbooks. The professional organization would say, here's the cash. Go and uh, uh, publish your own teaching material. You don't need teaching material from the United States all the time. It's good for you to develop your own material. <laughs> or the teachers in um, Sri Lanka would say, we don't like this elitist journal called TESOL Quarterly. <laughs> they don't they seem to understand uh, the, the issues that matter in our local communities. And the professional organization would say, it's good to have regional uh, journals because we need a two-way communication of knowledge here. Your knowledge has to come to us because an organization that doesn't uh, support uh, the diversity of practices is less than itself. We live through encouraging this diversity. <laughs> I understand this is very idealistic. Uh, these are just stray thoughts on how we can be different. Uh, but uh, there are good reasons why uh, a lot of people consider uh, TESOL a very American organization. And if you, to be frank, Harold Allen, when he describes the formation of TESOL, thinks of it as figure out practices that would make sense locally. Jennifer Jenkins says, there are different norms for English in different countries, that the target language has to be different. So. Uh, our coll collective voice seems to be plural, if, if it's not a paradox. Uh, we speak in many languages uh, with many different uh, uh, theories and assumptions. <laughs> of course, I understand it's kind of unnerving to have to deal with multiple practices, multiple theories, multiple labels. Um, but Wenger doesn't let us off easily. Wenger says, you can't adopt the approach of saying, you guys uh, follow your practice, uh, we will follow our practice, and we'll just live happily and separately. Wenger says, uh, the professional community brings these uh, communities together. So uh, he says, organizations help the local communities learn from each other by bringing them into contact, getting people to uh, see what other local communities are doing. So here's a nice point. Look at the other two words in our, our theme. Uh, we are interested in building communities of practices, which are also communities of inquiry, communities of creativity. And Wenger would say, that won't happen if you, def uh, if you define yourself around one theory, one method, one policy, because you're going to relax. There's no motivation to, con to continue to inquire to continue to be creative. It's only a community that values the diversity of practices that would think further on uh, the, the assumptions that would motiv motivate its practice. So then he goes on to the second most poetic line in the book, where he says, the local communities also have limitations. And this is where I think we need a larger professional community like TESOL to bring the local communities together. So he says, uh, the local community can be a cradle of the self, but also the potential cage of the soul. So it's true, University of Jaffna was a, cra uh, a cradle of the self for me. It nurtured my identity. It made me start well. It gave me a lot of protection. But if I remained there, uh, I could have also uh, ended up in a cage of the soul. I would have become inward looking, if not myopic in my vision. So am I glad that I met these three TESOL experts very early in my professional career? Yes, I am, and I'm thankful to the personal community for uh, bringing, uh, to arranging this meeting. Uh, they challenged me and created, me, created in me a kind of a professional restlessness, an intellectual curiosity that has sustained me till now. I'm here now uh, because of the uh, guys. <laughs> okay, the presentation is all this. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm happy that this happened, but I'm always asking myself, what would have happened if these experts
had stepped out of their air-conditioned hotels and taken a stroll down our villages and streets. What knowledge would they have brought back here? How would they uh, made a shift in the professional discourses around here? And I can tell you what they would have seen in our villages and markets. They would have seen English taking a new life in our soil. They would have seen English participating with many local languages to develop a new repertoire of communication. And we can't keep that to Africa or Asia or South America anymore. It's right here in our streets. So if you walk out of this hotel tomorrow, you're going to see signs like this. Uh, in the first image, you have a name of a shop in English, and the next is in Spanish. You can't close your eyes and say, I will read only English. It's an English-speaking country here. And the second image has a, a name of the shop in English. But if you want to understand what you can buy or rent there, you have to read it in Spanish. Um, my favorite example is this. Uh, it's a sign that was outside the Lincoln Tunnel when I uh, left home one day from Baruch College. I didn't know how to read this. Uh, uh, first, I thought they are saying, yes, we fly, fly, fly to Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a new nonstop flight. But then I thought the C should have a comma or a period or an apostrophe, which it didn't have. So it looked to me, they wanted me to write it, uh, read it as one whole sentence, in which case uh, it would be the uh, go and see Buenos Aires. It's a kind of a multilingual pun. <laughs> in Spanish, yes, you can fly to Buenos Aires. In English, go and see Buenos Aires. <laughs> but in, uh, in uh, Lincoln Tunnel, they had paid $10,000 or more to display this multilingual pun to me. And they were taking a gamble. They were thinking these poor Sri Lankans from 20,000 miles away, <laughs> they can figure this out that we all have the multilingual reading and speaking capacity to work with English joining another language to make sense. Now, we are trying to now study how this competence works, where English works with other languages to make sense. I wish I had the time to um, uh, go through this um, transcript for you. Uh, this actually appeared uh, in the latest issue of Modern Language Journal, and I have permission of Freya Cramps to display it to you. But if you uh, what's key here is uh, there are uh, four, pe uh, four people here, uh, a Yucatecan uh, farmer, uh, Don Francisco, a clerk uh, in a Vietnamese shop, and a manager who is also Vietnamese, and the researcher who is Anglo-American, who walked into the store for business, and in a matter of two minutes, they shuttle between four languages. If you just look at the clerk, the Vietnamese clerk, in uh, move two, she just finishes one interaction saying thank you, and then Don Francisco uh, talks to her, greets her in Spanish. He, she greets him back in Spanish. Then Don Francisco uh, tries a little Maya and greets her in Maya, the same question. So it looks like it's, it has a pedagogical purpose, a practice purpose. And she has forgotten the clock. So she says, how you say? And uh, her, the person who prompts her in this teaching is a fellow Vietnamese boss, Tommy, who says, Maolob. And, uh, the clerk greets back in Maya, and then move 10, talks to another customer in Vietnamese. Fourth language in, within eight moves, and English is one more in this repertoire. So, Claire Cramps asks, why don't we talk about communications like this in SLA? Why don't we teach things like this in English language classroom? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is in the whole journal. And what they say is, we have created convenient constructs like native speaker, non-native speaker, target language, interlanguage, user, learner. And what you see here is use and learning seem to go hand in hand. They're uh, learning on their feet as they speak. And we don't know if uh, Tommy should be considered a native speaker of Maya or not, but he's definitely teaching others Maya. So uh, we are being challenged to come up with new ways in which English participates in multilingual communication and I won't detain you with these different uh, definitions of this concept, but you can see it's a lot of excitement among scholars to try to define how English uh, joins other languages to become a multilingual repertoire and help people shuttle between languages. What's uh, fascinating for me is how late it has taken to address these questions, because this is the type of communication that I grew up with. This is the type of communication my parents and grandparents grew up with even before English came into the scene. But probably under fashionable uh, movements like globalization, 
transnational movement of people, diaspora communities, we are talking about these experiences in our journals. Well, it's going to involve some changes. It's not that there is no grammar, but there are new grammars that we have to be open to when languages come into contact. We had to perhaps learn uh, new uh, things as we adopt to teaching in new ways. So uh, it's possible that we started with simple constructs at one point, easy constructs at one point, but as social conditions change, as our knowledge develops, uh, we might have to uh, formulate newer models to explain what we are doing. So um, I'm glad that at least now uh, we are open to this kind of inquiry and creativity. And the interesting thing is we can start right here because Wenger says, here's a special place for conventions. And he says, conventions are the place, place where groups get out of their boundaries, cross boundaries, and meet people from other groups. Uh, so it's not only for professional communities like us, any organization outside, uh, he feels, should uh, have conventions. And um, uh, he, at the same time, this is how he describes the way conventions work. People come from two local communities, and here we are in the middle point, the third space, where we cross boundaries and meet each other. Um, but there's a risk involved. Sometimes we might form new alliances and form new communities and the old communities might become irrelevant. So uh, he, he's aware of this problem, but uh, he still feels, uh, you know, actually if you go back uh, to uh, the way uh, communities are formed, I think TESOL was formed once like this in the third space. Some of our professionals like Harold Allen uh, went to MLA uh, or AERA or uh, LSA, Linguistic Society of America, and thought, you know, we really don't fall into all these disciplines, either education or English or linguistics. We have another identity and form TESOL. And that doesn't have to stop now. So here let me give a shout out to our caucuses who are also adopting something similar. The black professionals, non-native teachers, Christian evangelical teachers. They come from so many different local communities, but here they share a third space where they uh, share ideas, develop new ideas, which they take back. So I come back to the role I adopted my, for myself uh, for personally, which Wenger says should be the value on which a whole organization is built. The organization values brokering. Uh, the organization is built on people crossing boundaries to learn from each other. So um, let me end with some tips on effective brokering in this conference. I know you're not looking forward for brokering, but conferencing as an activity that we all used to. Tomorrow morning, you'll be rushing from room to room, uh, trying to catch a little bit of the hundreds of sessions that are going on around here. Uh, you'll take copious notes in reams of paper to get the best method, the best technique that you take up home and never understand because you wrote so fast. <laughs> <laughs> you'll uh, scavenge for handouts and fill your bags with reams of paper, which you will never have the time to read when you go back home. But relax, we have more things to do. Uh, when you listen to a great method or a technique, try to ask yourself, from what conditions did this method uh, get formulated? What were the local conditions, the cultures of learning that gave, that gave birth to this? Ask yourself, uh, how can I unpack these theories, these methods, to try to find out what are the values, what are the assumptions that make this up, and how do they relate to me and my community? Uh, you can never borrow and implant one method that you hear directly in your community. Ask yourself, what kind of changes uh, would this uh, method have to go through in order to make sense to my teaching situation? Uh, and don't uh, be shy of uh, representing yourself. Uh, you have practices that are greatly valued that others need to know. So share where you're coming from. Imagine uh, the different worlds we all come from with different practices. Uh, imagine the new world for TESOL, uh, form an organization that has to answer new questions, new communicative practices around what kind of professional organization, what kind of theories would we formulate in order to address the type of challenges we have. And uh, when you do all this, you'll be humble tremendously. You'll think to yourself, where do I fit in? 
how uh, where do my theories and practices come from. So here, let me give a shout out to someone special who has made me critically lift, reflect on my practices. My alter ego. <laughs> she has helped me ask critical questions, sometimes cynical questions, uh, that have helped me um, be honest, uh, be balanced, be sane. <laughs> I guess I should have uh, written some other identities that I share in that list of multi-membership. There are certain identities that are left out, probably. But let me wish you three wonderful days of border crossing here. Uh, let me, I wish that all of us would be effective brokers for the communities we come from. I wish that uh, we would all do our part to reconfigure TESOL uh, into a professional organization that looks more like Wenger's model of a constellation of practices, a great paradox of people with diversity still calling themselves one community. I wish that uh, we would all uh, value, respect the diverse practices we have here in this conference, and in, through that process, uh, develop a professional community that is always inquiring, always creating. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you for being challenging. Thank you for being a master, a scholar, and a leader of T-Solars. We will hear more from Suresh during the convention and in the future. We are now going into three full days of community building and sharing our learning. Take every opportunity to explore and exploit all that's offered. Once again, enjoy. <laughs>